Hello, Malcolm here. Let me ask you a question. What kind of participation are you aiming for? When you preach, when you teach, what level and what kind of participation are you looking for? And how do you know if it's healthy or if it's even happening? That's what we're going to be talking about today. This is Tuesday Teaching Tips. It is number 253. And today it's inspired by the new module I've just started as part of my Master's in Theological Studies, which is on issues of contemporary worship. And of course, worship, often people think about singing, and that's certainly a large part of it. But it's more than that, isn't it? It's about when we gather and the issues around all the things that can happen when Christians gather specifically to worship God. So today I want to explore this topic. There's something on my mind because of some reading I'm doing about participation and what kind of participation we're looking for and hoping for or expecting uh, when we gather together to worship and you and I as preachers and teachers, what's our part in that? So more narrowly, it's a big topic, more narrowly for this recording in connection with preaching and teaching, not just not including music and prayer and other things. Maybe that's uh, a recording for another time. And I must confess a slightly selfish motive to this because I'm recording this in part to help my own understanding because it's part of my course. Now, this week, as part of the uh, particular work I'm doing at the moment, I've been reading uh, some uh, material by Craig Douglas Erickson. In fact, if you look on my channel, you'll find some recordings I've already done on this book he wrote called Participating in Worship, History, Theory and Practice. And in fact, it's part of the course I'm doing now as well. And I read this a while ago. I forget how we got connected to it. I did some recordings, I think more on the issue of the music side of worship than on the teaching and preaching side. So you may find that on my website and on the YouTube channel, the podcast feed. If you want to look at that, I think there's a whole series on participating in worship. But um, this is based on a different article I've been reading as part of my course, which is uh, this one here, if you're watching the video. Liturgical Participation and the Renewal of the Church. In fact, it takes quite a bit of inspiration from the book he wrote. He says this near the uh, beginning of the article. Christian worship is by its very nature participatory. Is participatory worship because all Christians are priests. Isn't that right? If we're all priests, and of course priests, we look at the old covenant, they were worshipping. Aren't we, as new covenant priests, all worshippers, especially when we gather? First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that, that, you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. This isn't just about those leading worship. It's not just about the people leading the songs or prayers or, or preaching and teaching. It's about everybody. And yes, it's about our daily life, not just when we gather, but doesn't it include the times when we gather? Romans 12 verse 1, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper uh, or reasonable worship, some translations say. So we're all worshippers. We're worshippers when we're alone, by the way that we live. And we're worshippers when we gather. And today that's what we're talking about. When God's worshippers are gathered to worship together, how should... Uh, how should this all work together? How are we doing at helping our worshippers worship? How are we as leaders of worship in our preaching and teaching as part of that? How are we doing at helping our brothers and sisters worship? And frankly, how do we even know how that's going? So a few brief thoughts today, and then I'd love to know what you think. Uh, please participate, uh, talking about participation, uh, in this by leaving a comment or sending me an email. Not only will you be helping each other, because we learn best when we learn in community, but you'll also be helping me with my next module and my next assignment on this, which will come up fairly soon. So I'd be grateful for your thoughts. So point number one, in terms of participatory worship and the preaching and teaching part of it, we need to, first of all, trust the Holy Spirit. Let, before we think about techniques and ideas and theories, let's think about the fact that God is present in every individual and he's present in the corporate group when we gather together because the Holy Spirit inhabits his worshippers, right? Romans 8 verse 9, you however are not in the realm of the flesh, but you're in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, 
they do not belong to Christ. We have the Spirit of Christ because the Spirit has come to indwell us through our repentance and baptism into Christ. And there's lots of great stuff on that in Ephesians chapter 1, for example. So he is inhabiting us, he's with us, he's in us. And he is active. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, we're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So the Spirit is not just inhabiting us. He's not uh, only doing that, and he's not passive in that. He's active in helping us to be transformed more into the nature of Christ. And so gathering together, he's, he's wanting to help that continue on that trajectory of further and greater transformation. Erickson says this on page 231 of this article, the experience of Christian worship is most fully accessible only to the illuminated, whose eyes have been opened to the mystery of prayer in the name of Jesus, whose conversion continues to be confirmed for, uh, for the, by the sanctifying grace and baptism. So this is what's happening. Now, let's think about the significance of this for our teaching and preaching. I don't know about you, but as I teach and preach, I do like to look up now and again and catch the eye of somebody and see whether they seem to be engaged. I mean, they're not checking on people, but, you know, it makes a difference if you look up and people are falling asleep or they're sort of looking disengaged or you have rather suspect that behind their Bible, they've got their phone checking Facebook. And I have seen that done. <laughs> um, that That's a little distracting to you and me, isn't it? We wonder, are people... Are they participating? Are they paying attention? Are they getting something from this? And are we collectively uh, participating together? But I think so, so one of the things we need to bear in mind is if the Holy Spirit is at work, he's not always at work in people in the way that you and I think he should be or might be. Someone might not be particularly engaged, for example, while they're in the building, while they're with you there. But you don't know what's going on once they've left gone away perhaps with a germ of an idea, something that lodged in their heart, something that didn't show on their face in the church service, but they're going away thinking about that. It hasn't happened, it hasn't happened to you, right? It's happened to me. I've gone away thinking about something. I may not have told anybody. It may not have looked like it, but I have. Erickson says this on page 234, immediate effectiveness can often be a misleading criterion by which to gauge the degree of participation. I like immediate effectiveness. I like it when I can, I think I can see my words have had an impact. Or I should say, of course, God's word has had an impact, but you know, through me. But that can be misleading because it may be ephemeral. Maybe just it, 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 it has a, a, an impact there and then, but then it's gone. But what about those who you can't tell if there's been an impact, but they've gone away with something? That's about trust. Trusting in the Holy Spirit. Some people express their participation outwardly, their face, in volume, they amen you. But others, they, they, they participate inwardly by thinking, by meditating, by chewing over something. So we've got to be careful not to judge those in front of us. Now, I do think if they're falling asleep, that's certainly problematic. But just because someone's not verbalizing, just because someone's not actually looking at you, doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is not at work. I've told the story before, but uh, my, one of the times my father came to hear me preach, one of the very first times, uh, he sat in the front row and closed his eyes. And I thought, oh gosh, I've bored the poor chap. Turned out later, I was talking to him and he said, no, 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 that's how I concentrate. That's how I take it in. I close my eyes because I find the visual distracting. Uh, maybe it's looking at me, it was distracting. I don't know. But um, but that's how he participates, is by closing his eyes and then thinking about what he's hearing. So let's be careful about judging people too quickly. The Holy Spirit is at work. Second thing to point out uh, is um, that preparation is very important. I think if we're going to help everybody participate, preparation is important. For example, the prayers beforehand by you and I, that our teaching will be participatory for the hearers praying for the congregation. Please, God, use your word, use my words of your word to help people actually uh, participate. That's a, an important point. And asking our congregation to pray for us. I mean, that's participatory in itself, isn't it? Asking them to pray for those who preach and teach, whether it's you or somebody else in your congregation. 
I think also praying that preparing ourselves that we're in the right place to lead others in a participatory way in our preaching and teaching. That we need to be in the best place we can be. Certainly no perfection demanded, but in that sense of I have prepared myself to deliver God's word in a way that I hope people will be able to uh, participate in. The other part of this, of course, is thinking about our techniques, thinking about the practical ways we're going to do this, thinking about using questions, whether using questions where we get responses from those we're teaching or whether we're asking questions for people to then reflect on and think about. Uh, using discussions sometimes in our uh, times of teaching, perhaps asking people to talk to each other or having a bit of Q&A with a congregation, making sure that what we're talking about is relevant to the group. Uh, using illustrations, using media, sound and sight and video and all those different things and possibly other things we haven't got time to talk about today. Preparing those is important. Um, it doesn't look to me as if the parables of Jesus were just um, off the cuff. You know, he happened to be standing there and talking and then thought, I know, let's talk about mm, uh, something or other. Oh, I'll make up a story about the prodigal. I, I, I don't get that feeling. I think he'd thought about this in, in advance. Whether he had gone out that day planning to teach it, I don't know. But these were not off the cuff. He thought about it. He planned uh, these uh, parables is my guess. It's a speculation, but I think it's a reasonable one. One of the things about the techniques, though, in this element of preparing to help people participate is the danger of it becoming potentially manipulative. How do we prevent these um, ways of, of engaging people to, from being manipulative? That's one of the big questions, and I don't have a, a really good, well-prepared answer to that right now. I would like your thoughts. It is one of the questions on uh, uh, in this module. How do we How do we help people participate without without forcing them to, without being manipulative? Uh, I think it's a really important question. I'm not sure what the answer is exactly to that. I do think sincerity matters. Uh, I do think having the best interest of our congregation uh, ahead of, of our own, of course, is so important. But in the end, I wonder whether there is some sense in which anybody who preaches and teaches, and I, I want to say this cautiously, cannot avoid manipulating those they're listening to and perhaps shouldn't be too worried about it because my goal when I stand up to preach is to persuade and the techniques I use the scriptures I use and other things are aimed at persuading people to something and I don't think that's manipulative in a bad way but perhaps you could say it's manipulative in some way so how do we persuade in a healthy way without being overt not not overtly without being over manipulative and trying to force people into a particular uh a direction that they may not have the capacity then to choose because we've been overbearing or bullying in some way interesting question i would definitely like your thoughts third thing to consider here with participation third thing well maybe one of the measures maybe this is the right way to put it how do we measure the effectiveness of congregational participation in the worship the preaching and teaching part of it at least i think part of it might be to ask ourselves how is this congregation growing in its engagement with the mission of christ there's a mission element here and part of that is about evangelistic effectiveness and that's a large part of it though not all of it because the kingdom's about more than that but i would say that participation in worship connects us uh, with the one we are worshiping, right? So that's part of it. We're we're connecting with our Father in heaven, and His heart is a missionary heart. So part of the effectiveness of our preaching and teaching is the way that we curate this experience of corporate worship, such that those who've worshipped with us and with their heavenly Father together are then more empowered and perhaps more catalyzed, more enthused and more equipped to engage in a missionary sense as an individual and as a congregation. So is that perhaps one of the ways we measure, I don't like the word measure because it sounds so formalized, but is it one of the ways we can sense that the participatory part of worship is being effective and valuable to God and to our effectiveness in the world? How are we doing in our mission, in all that means? Erickson says this, on page 232, the purpose of corporate worship is not corporate worship. The purpose of corporate worship 
is the glorification of God and equipping of Christians with power to carry out the mission of the church in the world. The two are inseparable, corporate worship and mission. Let me read that quote to you again because it's pretty good. So the purpose of getting together is not to get together, right? The purpose of getting together to worship together is the glorification of God, right? You can say amen to that. The equipping of Christians with power, amen to that. To carry out the mission of the church in the world, amen to that. The two are inseparable. So is that one way to evaluate how our preaching and teaching is going in that it's participatory to help one another to go and carry out the mission? A couple of final thoughts about barriers to participation. And again, I would like your thoughts on what you think are the key barriers to people participating in corporate worship together. Um, people sitting far apart, for example, that's problematic. Buildings being stuffy, that's a problem. Being too cold. What things get in the way of that sense of corporate participation in worship together? Of course, one of them is ignorance of the Bible. Because if you have to explain everything you teach in great detail because people don't know the Bible, that's problematic. So helping people to get to know the Bible is very helpful, very important. And also another barrier could be ignorance of why we do what we do. Why are we here? Why do we gather? Why do we sing? Why do we pray? Why do we take the Lord's Supper? Why do we fellowship? Why do we have a lesson? Have you explained that to your congregation? I mean, you might say, well, that's, shouldn't that be obvious? Yeah, um, perhaps to some, but not necessarily to others. Why not put a point about those things in one of your lessons? Explaining why we do what we do does help people to participate. If you don't know why you're there or why you're meant to be doing these things, why should you participate except that it's become a habit? And although habits are healthy things, habits can become dead ritual. And dead ritual is never a healthy thing. Well, I'm going to stop there. That's been long enough already. What do you think about all my points here about what kind of participation are you aiming for? And what are you thinking about in terms of uh, participation? Do you agree with Erickson? Do you think that uh, trusting the Holy Spirit is a key point? He's inhabiting us. He's active. He's working. Uh, let's not judge people. He works in different ways and different people. Some people uh, are outwardly expressive, some less so. What do you think about the point about preparation, preparing yourself and the congregation, uh, using certain techniques, avoiding becoming manipulative, but still, still being persuasive? That's okay. What do you think about the mission point, about the fact that uh, participating in worship connects us with that one who is uh, on a mission. God is on a mission. And, and so the uh, e evaluating our effectiveness of the participation in terms of how we're doing with mission as a congregation, does that fit for you or not? And then some of the barriers. Again, I would like to know what your thoughts are on the major barriers to participation in worship regarding especially, regarding especially the preaching and teaching of this amazing book. So those are my thoughts for today. I hope you find them helpful. Uh, give me some feedback, which will help me with my assignments. I'd appreciate that. And I think you'll be finding a few more of these coming out over the next few weeks as I continue to dig into the reading and this fascinating topic of issues in contemporary worship today. Well, that'll do for now. I hope you have a, uh, a, a terrific Tuesday and a wonderful week. Take care and God bless.